What's up, podcast listeners? Fawzal Mufti here from Westchester Medical Center, New York Medical College, and I'm your host on the Neurocritical Care Society podcast. Survivors of aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage face a protracted ICU course and are at risk for developing refractory hydrocephalus with a need for permanent ventricular peritoneal shunts. There is variability and uncertainty about the optimal approach to the management and discontinuation of an EVD after subarachnoid hemorrhage. How you manage the EVD may influence the need for a VP shunt, IC length of stay, and drain complications. But again, the optimal EVD management approach is unknown. According to a recent poll, the majority of neurointensivists employ a continuous CSF drainage with gradual wean strategy. And the question is, do you endorse that school of thought, or do you align with the intermittent CSF drainage and rapid EVD wean camp? If so, have you ever wondered why, other than the fact, of course, that this is how you've been trained? Another question is, does it really matter? Is there sufficient equipoise to justify a randomized control trial? Today, you will hear Dr. Holly Lightyard interview Dr. David Chong and Dr. Thompson on behalf of their co-authors to discuss their recent article entitled Association of External Ventricular Drain Wean Strategy with Shunt Placement and Length of Stay in Subarachnoid Hemorrhage, a Prospective Multicenter Study, published in the Neurocritical Care Journal. I hope you enjoy this episode. Um, so thanks for joining us for another episode of the Neurocritical Care podcast series. I'm Holly Ledyard. I'm an emergency physician and neurointensivist at the University of Utah. And today we are going to discuss a paper recently published in Neurocritical Care entitled Association of External Ventricular Drain Wean Strategy with Shunt Placement and Length of Stay in Subarachnoid Hemorrhage, a Prospective Multicenter Study. I'm fortunate enough to have two of the authors of this paper with me today. Dr. Chung, who is an assistant professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School and an attending physician in the neurocritical care units at Mass General Hospital and Boston Medical Center. And Dr. Thompson, who's the chief of the division of neurocritical care, medical director of the neurocritical care unit and director of the comprehensive stroke center for neurocritical care services at Rhode Island Hospital in Providence, Rhode Island. More recently, he was the medical director of a COVID intensive care unit at Rhode Island Hospital and is an associate professor in neurology and neurosurgery at the Warren Alpert Medical School of Brown University. Welcome, gentlemen, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah. Okay. Inerosmal subarachnoid hemorrhage is a condition associated with high morbidity and mortality, as well as protracted ICU stays due to high incidence of delayed neurological decompensation. One cause of decompensation in these patients is acute hydrocephalus, which can then become refractory, requiring placement of a ventriculoperitoneal shunt or VB, VP shunt. Um, diversion of cerebral spinal fluid by placement of an external ventricular drain or EVD can be life-saving in the acute phase of the disease process. However, the optimal management of the EVD remains controversial and is largely influenced by local culturally based practice. So tell me what was your impetus to tackle this particular aspect in the management of subarachnoid hemorrhage patients? Well, so th this actually all started coming out of uh, a guideline uh, update uh, that I did as part of uh, my fellowship in neurocritical care at Mass General. And I was paired with uh, Guy Rordorf, who is uh, one of my clinical uh, mentors and role models. And he uh, we were on the same guideline. We're working on this. And he'd always wanted to just, you know, clamp the drain and discontinue the drain uh, in this patient population for years and years and years. And the impetus for this guideline change was that we just gotten a new cerebrovascular neurosurgeon, Mon Patel, and he was familiar with both weaning uh, approaches, gradual and rapid. And so we had this opportunity to switch our institutional practice from gradual to rapid. And, uh, and so it all just came out of that. And in writing the guideline, um, as part of my fellowship, we're updating it. Uh, we looked at the literature and um, it actually seemed like the literature for rapid weans um, was uh, okay. I mean, there, there's only one uh, like decent study out there. There's a single center randomized study and it showed that a rapid wean was associated with a shorter ICU length of stay. But Really, you know, nothing uh, higher evidence after that. And that was published in 2004. Um, and it seemed like largely ignored uh, in practice. 
And so we wanted to know if our feeling that it was largely ignored was real or, or not. And so we decided to do a survey, uh, which we ended up publishing. And we found that, yeah, it is the case that most of uh, the vast majority of centers do a gradual wean, where you, uh, in a stepwise fashion, increase the uh, height of the EVD day by day, uh, as opposed to a rapid wean, which is typically just clamping the drain when you figure uh, patients is ready to get the drain out. And so we're in the minority and we're just about to change our institutional practice uh, from the majority to the minority. And um, that inspired this uh, before and after study um, that uh, we ended up uh, publishing a few years ago. Uh, Sham Rao uh, was a neurocritical care fellow at MGH, and I was just transitioning from fellow to faculty at the time. And so he won the, uh, the Neurocritical Care Society uh, Best Abstract Award for this work that showed that when we switched from a gradual to a rapid wean at MGH, that we decreased ICU length to stay. Uh, like the prior uh, randomized study showed. But surprisingly, we found that we ended up placing fewer VP shunts. So, so that was a surprise. Um, and it was a retrospective study. Uh, so that was the inspiration for this study, um, to, try to, uh, to try to do a prospective study where we look specifically at uh, VP shunt placement as a primary outcome um, and to you know, compare rapid versus uh, gradual. Uh, well, designing a multi-center trial around various varied practice patterns of different institutions and neur neurosurgeons must have been a little tricky. Um, tell us about your study design. Why did you choose to design it the way you did? Yeah, so that's right. So it's because it's so tricky to, to have a lot of folks um, agree to change practice uh, or to get on the same page, um, you know, understandably. Uh, that we decide to, decided to keep this an observational study. It, it seemed like a randomized study would not be feasible, at least on the multi-center study. We considered doing a, a single center randomized study, but we didn't figure that that would add appreciably to the literature. We, we figured we needed something multi-center. And uh, the fo we found in the course of doing the survey that the people who took their approach, they really believed in it, right? So the, the folks who did rapid weans, they really believed that was best. The places that did gradual weans, they really believed that was best. And so if there's any sort of bias, it, 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 the sort of the treatment bias goes away effectively because everybody's doing their best. Everybody thinks it's going to lead to uh, sh uh, better everything, basically, right? And so we figured, why don't we just see what happens when people try their best at what they think is best? Um, and that led to this uh, prospective observational study, which is not like a typical prospective observational study because in a way... The, the, treat, the quote unquote treatment uh, was predefined and assigned, right? So centers uh, were gradual centers or they were rapid centers. And we also analyzed uh, the data as intention to treat, um, which I, I was told later on, you can only really use when you're doing a true randomized trial. Uh, so we call it intention to treat like. So if you're at a gradual center, even if you took a rapid wean, we counted that as gradual just to get to take away that sort of bias and that sort of confounding. Um, and so I think this, I don't think the exact study has a name, at least one that I could uh, find out, uh, but uh, it's somewhere between a traditional prospective observational and a uh, randomized study as far as evidence base. Well, it's a really unique study design for sure. And I think your way to, um, eliminate that, that that treatment bias is pretty ingenious. So I, I appreciate uh, your approach to this, this kind of tricky situation with different practice patterns. Um, so your primary outcome in the study was the incidence of VP shunt placement, both acutely as well as in a delayed manner. So tell us what you discovered. Well, we found that... Um... We found that among the six centers that were included, uh, some of which took a rapid wean and some of which uh, took a gradual wean, that a rapid wean overall was associated with a fewer VP shunt placements. Um, and uh, we also looked at uh, length of stay and EVD related complications. As uh, prior studies had suggested, uh, length of stay was shorter uh, by about two and a half ICU days. Uh, in the rapid group. Uh, and then there are fewer EVD related complications uh, driven by uh, fewer clogged shunts. So those are our main findings. And, and, and Brad, I don't, you know, so 
so Brad, it was, it was really great having uh, these discussions with Brad because he made sure that uh, we looked at every uh, different way to make sure we weren't, to make sure, to make sure that we're interpret, interpreting our results uh, appropriately and framing everything in a fair uh, way. Yeah, I would say that that my role in all of this is is as David's foil. As he pointed out, the uh, people who believe in rapid really truly believe that it's the right thing to do. And and those of us uh, who, at least before this study, believed in gradual felt strongly about that. What we tried to do is uh, the best job that we could in a in a pragmatic way to account for, for those beliefs and and other potential biases to sort of take the the evidence to the next best place that we could go to try and address these these questions. Uh, looking at BP shunt placement, you know, there's a couple of different ways to to look at it. There were numerically fewer BP shunts uh, placed in the in the rapid wean uh, group, and then in fewer uh, sorry more uh, VP shunt free days in the, in the rapid group. But there are a lot of uh, nuances. I wanted to make sure that we weren't uh, overstating our, our claims and getting ahead of the evidence. Very good. Um, you have a lot of information in this supplemental data um, for the paper. And um, I would encourage the listeners to take the extra time to, to look up the supplemental information that has a lot of, of um, I think, some valuable information in there. Were there any findings in your study that surprised you? Well, so uh, I mean, th- this may yeah, this this may be a question for Brad, um, but uh, but but I'll say that I'm always I'm always surprised to see significant effects, even even when I believe in something and and and, and think you know, something is better than the other. When you study it, there's so much noise. And these studies are not, these studies are hard to do, right? And there are all these variables that you're trying to keep track of. And, and so um, I don't want to say I was surprised, but uh, well, yeah, I mean, it, yeah, we saw something significant. So that, that, that yeah, I was a little surprised that we had um, these robust findings. And so we were trying to do everything we could to make sure they were real. Um, as far as we can tell, right? Because there's so much variability between the centers. Um, we got as many centers as, as we uh, thought could do this study with us uh, uh, well, um, but it's still only six. Um, and so I think just given these limitations, you know, I, I think we were lucky that we were able to see some signal for anything through the noise. So given my uh, pre-established bias going into the study, the, the, the primary outcome was a surprise to me. I, I think uh, there's a lot more to the story yet to be told, and I, I think David would say the same thing that there's that there's more work, more work to be done here. Uh, you know, I would I would look forward to uh, additional information on things like vasospasm, which is uh, uh, something that I, I think is likely uh, would would be affected by, um, if not the wean strategy, at least sort of the open versus close at baseline uh, strategy, which we didn't uh, really get into uh, in this study. Um, one other interesting finding I thought was that although the uh, EVD and ICU uh, length of stay was shortened in the rapid group, there was no change in the in the hospital length of stay. Given given one claim or one theory that the advantage of of going to an earlier VP shunt is to get the patients off to rehab more quickly, then perhaps that's not the rate limiting step. And so that, that might not be a factor. And of course, I think both of us would really like to see long-term functional outcome. What does this really matter in, in the end? And that's uh, something uh, I think that we would both uh, look forward to to seeing. Yeah. Dr. Thompson, you just mentioned that, that you didn't take into account delayed cerebral ischemia or vasospasm. Why did why did you decide to leave that piece of it out? Well, from a, I, I think we simply didn't have uh, enough uh, numbers, to clarity of definitions to make that uh, something that we could uh, look at with with confidence. It is, I think, an important piece, just an, another one of the pieces that adds up to the ultimate uh, goal, which is which is functional outcome, and it's uh, something that I think we're very interested. In. I don't know, David, if you have more to comment on that. Yeah, no, that, that's absolutely right. I mean, that, that's a key question, um, Holly and, and and Brad. Yeah, it's, it's, of course we want to know, but um, it's hard to do. Um, and so, 
yeah, going into this, uh, we knew that that would be of interest, right? So uh, whether or not this would affect delayed cerebral ischemia, that, that whole syndrome, right, with or without vasospasm. And uh, we decided that we didn't have the resources to do the central adjudication necessary to do that study well. And so we didn't uh, fold that into one of our a priori hypotheses that it, this, would, this would or would not affect uh, DCI. We were very careful to, to do that. Of course, we'd love to do that, uh, but also the, the, uh, the definition of symptomatic vasospasm and, and DCI is just, that, that itself is fuzzy, right? And so of course, those studies looking at that are, are, are certainly worthwhile and one of the biggest questions in the field, but uh, we were trying to address a very practical, specific question. And so we didn't want that to have that uh, derail us, basically. We did, though, look at vasospasm, so radiographic vasospasm, which is more objective, right? So uh, looking at TCDs, looking at CT angiography or conventional angiography, and we kept track of that, and the centers had, had, had that reliably uh, reported, you know, without a need for the central adjudication that you need for clinical uh, symptoms. Um, and so we didn't see a difference in radiographic vasospasm, but, but of course, as uh, many of our listeners know, radiographic vasospasm doesn't necessarily mean DCI. Um, right. So you talked about a little bit about, you know, numbers and having just only six centers involved. What were some of the other major limitations to your study? To, to me, the major limitation is uh, any potential differences in the in the either the patient population or the or more likely the treatment decisions uh, made by the individual centers. As as I said, and I think David said as as well, we did sort of the best we could to uh, account for those those differences. But there are always potential unmeasured uh, differences that might uh, might add up to a, a real factor. And so I think we would both agree, we would all agree that the, the right answer ultimately is a randomized controlled trial. Um, but, but this brings us uh, another step in that direction and is really a, um, uh, a forward step in the, in the evidence. So I think that's the, that's the clear next step. Excellent. One, of the, one, one of the things that I love uh, uh, that, that Brad said was, you know, we don't have functional outcomes. Right. And so that, that's really the key, right? We, we want to make sure that uh, folks don't have worse functional outcomes with either therapy or, or take that into account. And, and one of the, I, I think one of the sticking points is that, you know, fine, say, say rapid really is generalizable and, and, and better for fewer VP shunts and decreased length of stay, right? Well, what, what does that do to functional outcome? And, and I think uh, a lot of the hesitance uh, in folks I've spoken with um, uh, is that you know, if we, if we uh, do rapid weans and if we discontinue the EVD uh, earlier, maybe we're tolerating a certain degree of asymptomatic hydrocephalus that may lead to worse cognitive outcomes. And there's not much evidence for that but there's not much evidence against it either. I, I really think it's a genuinely uh, fair concern. Um, that said, the effect can't be huge because if the effect were huge, we, we'd, we'd see it by now, right? So it'll be a smaller effect, but maybe you'd say, well, if this were your loved one, wouldn't you want to have that? So there, there's this balance, I think, between having to deal with the VP shunt and potentially having a... Um, worse cognitive outcomes um, by avoiding a VP shunt. Um, and so then the question is how to do that study of functional outcomes. And this is sort of plagued our field just for, for, you know, we, when you have patient, even populations cohorts that are much larger, we just, we just don't have so many patients to look at functional outcomes or have the appropriate functional outcome to, to measure. And so what I wonder is if there could be some sort of intermediate outcome that, that we could look at just to see if there's a maybe physiological basis for worse functional outcome. Maybe looking at blood flow, uh, maybe looking at longer term imaging. Um, and so I, I think there's a lot of opportunity here to address some of these concerns without having to do a gigantic 
super expensive study. I think another Great. important factor uh, too would be to establish some sort of uh, baseline agreed upon management approach with the exception of the variable of interest, right? So I think we can all agree that there's no clear evidence-based determination of lots of these uh, different aspects of EBD management, but let's just, as a, as a group, uh, perhaps decide that we're all going to uh, put our EBDs at 10, for example, or, or whatever, and leave it open until we get to the weaning strategy, or uh, what will be the determining factor that it's okay to start a wean of whichever type, and what are the, uh, what are the determinants for um, VP shunt placement and does radiographic hydrocephalus count, et cetera. And so sort of def define all of these management strategies, um, knowing full well that we're not 100% sure that which of them is correct, but just deciding, okay, for the purposes of, of this, we'll agree to this management strategy uh, with the exception of the variable of interest uh, and then uh, pick away at the problem uh, in, that, in that way. Do you have any, are there any trials in, in the works looking at these things? I hope so. <laughs> One I mean, that you're aware of? Well, yeah, I, I talked to some other folks about uh, starting something like this up, but it's such an undertaking. You know, it's a challenge to find funding. And so I think the key is to try to find a feasible study design that that is a, a higher level of evidence than what we have right now. And I, you know, I, I don't know, like, I think the study is pretty good. Um, we've just said what the limitations are and the caveats, but, um, you know, at least at MGH, I know that rapid is better, right? Because we did that before and after study, right? I just don't know if it's generalizable to other places, right? Because of the hundred other variables, right, that, that are different. I think one potential study design that's not a randomized study could be why don't you why don't we take folks uh, at their center they're doing one thing and then switch over to the other thing um, and then at least you have this internal control yeah crossover trial yeah yeah so sort of an institution level crossover trial I think that'd be terrific but but there are issues there and and you may be criticized for for not being a randomized trial but then again randomized trials aren't perfect because Right, I think I think many of us have, have participated in them in some form as far as like trying to enroll a patient. It's really hard to enroll a patient in a randomized trial, right? So all those folks aren't getting in the trial. So who are we studying, right? And and then also for a question like this, where uh, where basically you're relying on the entire system in the ICU to go towards a particular approach. Can you imagine opening an envelope, for example, and seeing rapid for one patient and then opening another envelope and gradual for the patient like down the hall? And then the treatment team has to think about one approach for one patient, another approach for another patient. It, 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 seems, it seems very challenging to, to do that, right? As opposed to mobilizing all at once to switch over. So I think there are different, uh, other sorts of different uh, potential trial designs. If folks think that we need more evidence, so, it, um, but I think it's it's for the readers to decide and for the, for the field to decide that. Um, I'm curious, did your findings in this paper lead any of the um, centers that were in the gradual wean um, group to adopt a more rapid uh, weaning strategy? Oh, that's a great question. It may put some folks on the spot, uh, but I don't know, this, this paper just came out. Uh, so, so I don't know if anybody's changed their practice yet based on the results of the study. We have not at this point. I can say though that the, the needle has moved a little bit. Um, I, I, think a, I think a rapid wean, I have more faith in the potential uh, advantage of a, of a rapid wean over a gradual uh, wean. I do, we didn't address this exactly in our study, but I, I, I do believe still in the in an open drain as opposed to a closed drain as a as a baseline. But perhaps when 
when we deem uh, an EVD as being uh, ready to be weaned, then then perhaps a rapid wean at that point from a from an open position is something. As I say, the needle the needle has been moved, and so uh, that's that shows the power of of the study to get people who are perhaps a little bit entrenched in our views to consider the possibility of, uh, of, of it being better the other way. I mean, Br- Brad has a harder job than I do. So, so Brad actually leads a ICU and, 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 is, and is in leadership. So, so I, I can just go around, you know, testing things out and, 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 and not having to mobilize entire divisions and, and departments. Uh, but but I, I think what would be cool is if anybody out there is considering switching from gradual to rapid to, to get to get together with the other gradual hospitals or institutions that are considering switching over and then just doing it together, right? In a prospective way. And uh, right, so, so then you could, you, could, you could do that crossover study. I, I've already gotten a few emails from folks who, who've seen the study come out, you know, considering going from gradual to rapid and why not do it in a studied, in a studied way? Some, some folks may find that when they switch from gradual to rapid, that maybe their VP shunt rate goes up, who knows, right? But that should be reported. And it'd be great if that was reported, you know, over multiple institutions, you know, registered as, as a trial. And, uh, and so that, you know, it won't be lost so that we don't have this publication bias. So, so that we can have this extra confidence. Well, I certainly think that it provides some extremely valuable information on a very predominant disease process that we all deal with and adds new insight to appropriate management. I know from our standpoint, we're a gradual wean kind of center, and I look forward to reviewing this paper with the residents and some of our neurovascular folks to see what they think about changing strategies. So this may be the beginning of, of a big change in how we manage patients with aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. So I commend you on your hard work and a difficult study design. And are there any last pieces of information you want to leave with our listeners? Well, so, so there's one question about how an, an EVD we might lead to decreased VP shunt placement. Oh, right. I completely forgot. No, Hang on. Hang on. <laughs> no, no. So, I ask you so, that question. Yeah, well, uh, but, but I mean, aside from that, we, we get this question about how an EVD wean might lead to decreased VP shunt placement, right? I mean, what's the mechanism? And it, it's, it's interesting because really not that much is known about acquired hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus just in general is this big mystery. And uh, we say that what happens is that the arachnoid granulations get clogged with blood, right? Just because it's just, you think about sinks and plumbing, right? But that, that has to be an oversimplification, right? And, and also we find delayed BP shunt placement and delayed hydrocephalus, right? So after the blood is gone, the ventricular system isn't working well and people need delayed shunts. So that doesn't really explain that. And then also there could be this idea of maybe maybe increasing the ICP by raising the drain might decrease uh, CSF production, right? So you have to think about the, the outs, uh, but also the ins, right? But that's also somewhat speculative. And then there's this question of ventricular dynamics, right? So there's this pulsatility to the brain that's not the whole brain's not pulsatile, pulsatile all at once, because if it were, your head would explode, right? So you have these pulsations that are regional, and that probably drives CSF flow. And so you could imagine if um, you have an aneurysm rupture and IVH, it could screw up the, all those dynamics. But that's like incredibly complex. And so, yeah, we don't really know. Uh, the, the way that I just I tell people just because it's intuitive is maybe just a little extra pressure primes the system so that uh, the arachnoid granulations or, or even the lymphatics might come back online. But it, it is it is speculative still. So I've I've always wanted to study this in the lab, and if anybody uh, is is interested in this too, then, then you know ho- hopefully you can reach out and we can find a way to study it together. But yeah, so that's a long way of saying that I don't I don't know. Um, but it, but it is this outstanding question. Any last thoughts, Dr. Thompson? I think I'll leave it leave it there with David's comments. Uh, I think uh, he's he's clearly the uh, emerging leader on this topic, and will um, will get us to the final answer eventually. I'm sure. Brad, 
you're too modest. Uh, like there's no way this could have happened without without you. Um, there, there's no way this paper would have been as good, I think, as it, as it is w without you. You're, you're sort of totally key to this. So you're, you're very modest. Thank you. Well, I think it's a tremendous paper, guys. Um, and I look forward to any future work that uh, both of you do on this topic, as well as the other things that you're interested in. So that's all I have. And thanks for your time. I appreciate you joining us today. Thanks so much. Thank you. You bet. Thanks for listening to the NCS podcast. The NCS podcast is produced by the Neurocritical Care Society, whose mission is to promote quality patient care, professional collaboration, research, training, education, and advocacy in neurocritical care. Our production staff includes Tarek El Maghribi, Andrew Barishmit, Leonid Groisman, Atul Kalanuria, Lauren Kaufman, Cassie Cronfield, Holly Ledyard, Lindsay Marchetti, Alexander Reynolds, Lucia Rivera Lara, John Rosenberg, Jason Siegel, Zachary Threckle, Teddy Yoon, and Chris Zaman. Our administrative staff and senior producers, Bronnie Rosso. Music by Mohan Katapali from the University of Miami Division of Neurocritical Care. If you like our show and want to learn more about us, check us out on Twitter, Facebook, or LinkedIn. The NCS podcast is available on NCS On Demand, iTunes, and wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Fawaz Mufti, and thanks for listening.